Views expressed by Casters Guild members are only the opinions of that member, and that could change from day to day. Guild members may use mature language, but that in no way means they are mature. Listener discretion is advised. Hey everybody, welcome to the first episode of Casters Guild. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, this will be a very non-formatted episode, I guess you'd say. We don't necessarily have a topic today. Not formatted, um, but very professional. Oh yeah, 100% professional. I mean, like, obviously, we're nothing but professionals here. <laughs> so anyway, I, my name is Rick Perry. I am one of your Casters Guild Guild Masters. We'll go into a little bit more about what this cast is about later. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to my other guild master so he can introduce himself. Yep, I'm Baron Kane, the other uh, guild master of the uh, Casters Guild. Again, totally professional and totally ready for everything that's going to be thrown at me tonight. And then with us, um, we have a guild member. Howdy. And he can introduce himself however he wants. Uh, my name is Parker Garza. I'm just a guild member. I probably won't be on every time, but uh, I'll be on as much as I can, and I'm kind of excited to get into it. He's going to be a good guild member. He's going to be here to back us up whenever he can. I like long walks on the beach, um, and I'll, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, <laughs> guild master. <laughs> <First impression>. um, <laughs> so let's uh, let's start with some of your interests. What what qualifies you to be a casters guild guild master, if you will? Years of being weird. I guess, is my first qualification. Gamer, just lover of, well, just being there for all the cool-ass 80s cartoons firsthand, I think, is enough as well. I guess experience, age, I'm older than you, Parker. I know. I'm, I'm the youngest guild member. Yeah, I know. I just wanted to let you know. For now. <laughs> <laughs> we um, are taking applications. Yeah. And when I say gamer, I, I will say that I'm not a good video gamer. I know. I like video games. Oh, is that? Okay. I thought you were yeah. talking to me. No, no. Uh, I'm not a good video gamer, but I do like video games. If I could play a video game with no challenge whatsoever just to read the story, I would do so. But I am. Well, you, you're in the golden age of gaming for you then, because like oh, yeah. half the games I play like have that difficulty setting where like oh, if you just want to experience this game for the story, choose this difficulty setting, and it's for you. Yeah, it was $10, and we'll just kind of... Right. I, I think I played God of War 4, and I used the uh, cutscene option. Uh. <laughs> it just gave me all the cutscenes. I was good to go. Not to mention, I mean, like, we're in the era of Let's Plays, so if you just want to watch the story of a game, you could literally just watch somebody else play it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I... I, I uh... I watched uh, Neebs, and I was pretty sure that I played Conan for the longest time, and then I actually played it, and I was like, what the fuck's happening? This isn't what I remember <laughs> playing. Uh, this uh, episode of the Caster's Guild is brought to you by Girl Scouts. Um, go get some... Go Hashtag get some. not sponsored. Hashtag not sponsored. <laughs> Girl Scouts of America paid us copious amounts of cookies to say this on our mm. very small <laughs> stream. <laughs> go get, go get, go get your cookies. This is how you get sued, people. All right. We're very professional. <laughs> Episode one, title, How to Get Sued. Wouldn't it be <laughs> cease and desist by the Girl Scouts? Oh, my God. <laughs> it would be a story. Hashtag goals. Oh, wait, no. But then people would question why you got that, and it would turn into something yeah. horrifying. Oh, no, it'd be a whole thing. We'd be all over the news and not in a good way. They say there's no such thing as bad pl publicity, but I guarantee you there is. Oh, yeah, especially if they gave no context. Oh, yeah. cease and desist by the Girl Scouts. Well, let me tell you why. Oh, no, we've heard enough. Uh, okay. I'm fired, aren't I? <laughs> uh -huh, no context. They just, show, they just show a picture of us. Just like two middle-aged, fat-bearded uh, men. Cease I and know. Desist. Good Lord. We, Girl Scouts. we need to start taking care of ourselves so we don't look like stereotypical just creepers. You guys are fucking creepers. Look, I'm keeping the beard off my neck. Leave me alone. So, uh... <laughs> Let's see. I've I've been a geek for a really long time, and I have lots of geeky interests. I uh, I'm a little bit younger 
than uh, than our other guild master. So I didn't grow up with the '80s cartoons, but I think '90s cartoons did their job. That and we had shows like Power Rangers, and uh, we had Toonami. So like that was you know your good old Dragon Ball Zs and your the, Sailor Moons. The, and... the birth of the American anime renaissance, right there. I remember Toonami. Uh, yeah. So I got into that. I was discouraged by my parents into getting into some of the geekier stuff as they wanted me to grow up with friends and like be like socially accepted and stuff like that. Um, I don't think they realized that like as I was growing up, that was the era when like, you know, being a nerd or being a geek was starting to be cool. And by trying not to be a geek, I actually ended up making less friends than I would have made if I had just been, you know, myself. See, but mine was different. Yours didn't want you to be a geek because they were afraid you wouldn't make friends. Mine didn't want me to be a geek because they were afraid I would make one very bad friend, the devil. Oh, uh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like an investment for you guys because when I was going through high school, like there wasn't a like an issue. Like, like a huge stigma. Yeah. So it was like you guys got the shit end of it, but now you're like at the top of like this. The geeks are cool now hierarchy. You know what I'm saying? Which actually I would like to talk about that. Too, especially given the different uh, snapshots of uh, geek windows that we have right now. I, w- I want to see uh, where we feel about this. But anyways, go ahead. But uh, just general list. I mean, I uh, really like tabletop games, tabletop RPGs. I really like video games. I wouldn't say I'm not a good gamer, but I'm also not a bad gamer. Like, I'm just casual in this little cusp where, well, I mean, like, maybe a little bit more than casual i'm in this weird cusp where i'm better than all my friends that i actually know but like if i hop online with people who actually know what they're doing i get completely demolished so Mm -hmm. it's you know i'm I'm a big fish in a small pond but like if i tried to jump in the ocean like that's i no, that's that's not me that's fair um and a lot of people think i'm a huge comic book nerd but i could probably count the amount of comic books i've read on less than two hands well that's good because that's all you have right yeah, that's it. That's all. That's okay, the two. I was actually yeah. needing an answer after that yeah. hesitation. It was like he does. <laughs> well, I started to think about like whether or not I should preface that I could have started counting on my toes, but I didn't need to. But I was like, you know, just just the two hands. Yeah, that's fair. I will say, when it comes to comic books, like the one reason I know a, quite a bit about comic books, and like my friends would ask me questions when like things for the MCU started to come out. Is because I would get lost down uh, Wikipedia holes for Marvel and DC. Like, I would just look something up, and then I'd be go, oh, that's neat. What about this? Oh, that's neat. What about this? And I'd just, you know, get click on link after link after link on Wikipedia and read the backstories for characters, uh, which is how, like, Spider-Man and the Black Panther became my favorite superheroes, just getting lost down their respective Wikipedia holes. Wow. He got lost down there. All right, man. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. I know. I guess I grew up in uh, like a very sheltered family, so like we didn't. I didn't really know I was a geek until like sixteen or seventeen. So I've only been. I'm twenty one now. So I've only been a geek for like I don't know a couple of years. What really? What really broke you out into the geek? Uh, well, like what really D&D. expanded your world? D and D. Well. I was at a game store and I started hanging out with some people and I met this guy who owned that game store and uh, he seemed pretty cool. And uh, <laughs> beyond my mom's instructions, uh, <laughs> I decided to start hanging out with this person more. And uh, the next thing I knew, my dumb ass was buying a $50 book <laughs> and uh, I was him, so I kept buying them. And then, you know, like yeah. 10 books later, can confirm. Can confirm. Oh, and Magic the Gathering. I, I, oh, yeah. You, you came into that. You yeah. came in with that obsession, right? Yeah, that was, that was a buddy of mine. Yeah, so I'm a, kind of a new to the whole nerd scene or geek scene. I don't even know my uh, my phrases yet. So that's why I'm just a member. We have phrases? Yeah, like you're, a, like you're for the wins and you're Leroy Jenkins. And yeah, and you're like LOLs and, you know, LOL League of Legends. And, uh, LOL League of Legends. And, um, and Cat GG and QQ never, more. Yeah, I've never played uh, War. What is it called? The uh, Keck. Where did that come from? That online game. Huh? When your cousin always play or your nephew. Wow. You World of Warcraft. Wow. World of Warcraft. That's what it is. I've never played it. I hear it's good. I played World of Warcraft a lot. It was fun. 
I started Again, playing World of Warcraft good at it. because Barrett played World of Warcraft. Because what? Because you played World of Warcraft. Oh yeah. So what was your and then, experience like experience in D and D? Tried D and D. Oh well. Uh, fun fact: I am a Navy veteran, and I was in the United States Navy at the time, and I was aboard the great warship, the USS Enterprise, and uh, uh huh, and I was um. On my way back from my shift, uh, if anybody doesn't know how it works, basically, if you're on, if you're deployed, you work 12 hours on, 12 hours off, seven days a week. And so after my shift was over, I was on my way through the mess hall in order to get to my rack because the shop where I worked and my birthing area were on two different sides of the ship. Um, and when I say two different sides, I don't mean port and starboard. I mean stern and, and bow. So, like, it was the entire length of the aircraft carrier. Yeah. But anywho, I was walking through, and, like, I saw a bunch of guys rolling dice. And I was like, what's this all about? Um, because I was an adult at that point, and I had been exploring my geeky side because my parents were not there to tell me, hey, you shouldn't do that. And they were playing, I think, Vampire the Masquerade at the time. Um, and so, like, I started watching them play and then they started playing another game called um i think it was called exalted which is another d10 system joined in on that game and i played exalted with them then they played uh dungeon dragon 3.5 for a little while and i only played in about three or four sessions of that and i didn't like it at all and like it turns out i just didn't like that um because of the game and like you know the direction it was going and the way the dungeon master told the story but one of the guys who was in that game with, um, you know, lived like right next to where I lived when we came back from the deployment and we started hanging out. Um, and he invited me to come to a D and D game that another friend of his was going to be DMing, which was Baron. And that was a game of fourth edition. Now fourth edition, while being notorious for being a really bad version of D and D, never played. <laughs> I <laughs> fell in love with Dungeon because of fourth edition if not for fourth edition like i don't think i would have got into it if not um, for fourth edition you'd have played third edition and you'd have fucking loved it <laughs> but you know i know i fell in love with fourth edition i loved using like different powers and getting the cards and like you know doing the things that i was doing um i ran that game a lot after that just because nobody else was playing it so i had to run it in order to make games but like once fifth edition came out i did immediately jump over and i've been playing fifth edition ever since yeah. Now, yeah, fifth edition. Hold on. Is this? Yeah, it's coming through. Um, fifth edition. <laughs> I can't. I can't. <laughs> fifth edition is pretty good. Third edition is always going to be my favorite. You cheeky fuck. <laughs> third edition's always going to be my favorite. <laughs> when you say third, do you mean like straight third, or are you talking like three point five? Are you It'll lumping them here. together? To me, it's all the same thing. All the same, okay. I'm that third, third, three. I was asking. Three point five to me is just third edition with errata, and then Pathfinder is just third edition with just a little more errata. Okay, <laughs> I, I, honestly, I've never, I've played three point five, I've played Pathfinder, I've played mm -hmm. fifth, and I've played fifth. Um, I've never played three, you know, three point oh or two or one or any of that. So I, I just, I honestly don't know the difference. I mean, like I hear the stories from like the people who have been playing since the beginning about things like Thacko and stuff like that. And I'm like, what's a Thacko? And then they explain it to me. And what's I'm like, I still don't know what Thacko. I, I didn't want to Thacko, Thacko means to hit armor class zero. And armor class zero wasn't the best armor class you could get, but it was a good baseline to base your ability to hit said armor classes. The lower your armor class, the better. A base of 10, I believe, was naked. If you had 10 armor class, you were just running around naked. Okay. And not moving. So, like, right now, I would have an armor class of 10. Yeah. Yeah. And then right. your, we all would. Your, your dexterity yeah, we all. could add to that, or to take away from that. Hmm. Um, and then armor didn't take away... It didn't give a bonus it gave you an armor class so like if you were wearing like chain mail it was an ac of four that's yeah. it that's just it I, I i so it just replaced whatever your armor class was yeah yeah i don't know uh just from you explaining it i think i like 5e's ac better i no no yeah i like the uh 
ability to like it just adds bonuses and stuff to your AC. Mm -hmm. I, I like that better. What's your guys' favorite monster in like Ooh. All tabletop games? What in all tabletop games? Oh, you, you, that's that be, be a yeah, little too broad. Just, Is that too much? Is that yeah. too much down box? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. A, little, a little much. Um, let's do okay. So I immediately want to say like a red dragon or a beholder just because of how iconic they are. Yeah. And like when you throw one in a game, people know what they're getting into and like it's it's a it's a really fun time. But I feel like one that's a really basic answer and two it's not like my real answer. I really like things that do things that are unexpected. Like you look at a monster and you're like, oh, that's going to do this thing. And then it does something entirely different than what you were expecting mm. based on its looks. Like I forget what the monster was called. There's a monster um, in one of the, the, in the very first module that's made for, for 5e. And like, it's a classic monster. So I shouldn't be referencing this way, but like that just shows how much of a D&D &D noob I really am. Lost Minds of Phandelver, there's a monster that you come across and it's hiding in the dark, and your players can't see it. I mean, like, if they do end up seeing it, it looks just like this gremlin-y thing with one eyeball and, like, long fingernails and whatever. Some of this look is going to, like, brush you and tear you apart. But it's actually a very psychological monster. It, like, automatically reads the minds and memories of the adventuring party and starts whispering things in their mind that would make them, you know, not want to be there. It's a nothing. Oh, Nothic is what it's called. I know those. Yeah, it's those, are, those are cool. Yeah, and so like basically, like I had a group of adventurers when I was running Lost Minds of Phandelver. I had a group of adventurers who had never played D and D before, except for my wife, and she had only played a few. We played modules from Fourth Edition, um, but that's all she had ever played, and everybody else was had never played D and D before, right? But due to this day and age, they had watched things like Critical Role. They had heard of their friends' stories in D&D. &D. And so, like, I had, like, this really good group because all they knew of D&D &D was that you could use it to tell a really good story. You know what I mean? So, like, that's what they were all trying to do, which was amazing. Um, so, like, every one of these, these people, I had, like, these page-long backstories that they had written out for me. You know, their hopes, their fears, their strengths, their weaknesses, everything. So when they came across the Nothic, I was able to role-play like exactly what they needed and like what i did was i actually kind of kept it a secret from everyone because the nothic was individually speaking into their minds so i was actually writing on post-it notes mm. like this is what you hear in your head and handing it to that character and being able to see on their face like the emotional impact that these things i was writing was having on them was just an awesome experience as a dungeon yeah. master so Great i think lies right That's yeah cool. and like the thing is if they'd actually got their like got their hands on this thing they'd be be eat, immediately be able to demolish it because yeah. like the level where they were and like you know the cr rating of that monster but just like you know be able to play with them a little bit so i think because of that experience i'll have to say my favorite monster in D, &D is the nothic gelatinous cube i knew you were gonna say it <laughs> there's either that or werewolf uh yeah see werewolf the problem with werewolves in D and D is that another game ruined werewolves in role playing, in that they made it better, and that would be uh, Werewolf the Apocalypse. A lot of the classic monsters in D and D, like if you come across like a werewolf or a vampire or a mummy or a ghost, like you know things that people traditionally think of as scary or a zombie. Like, they don't have the same impact as in D&D &D as they do in other media unless you change them from rules as written in oh order to have that kind of impact. Again, not, uh, not sponsored by this guy because he doesn't sponsor people. He gets sponsored. But the, uh, is it, what's the, the podcast? Is the animated spell book? Z Bradshaw. Z Bradshaw. Oh, my God. He did a rewrite on uh, zombies. That oh my god, he made them infectious. He made them able to spawn other zombies. So he just buffed them up. Oh, it was beautiful. I the zombies that you want from movies. Like I sat there watching feel. this with a raging censored. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, we'll watch it. We'll watch it seriously. N not the censored. Before we get too far. Off yeah. What? Why gelatinous cube? Gelatinous cube. It. It for me. It. It goes with that iconic 
it, and it's simple and it's and it's beautiful. Like I love the way they look. Just the 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 mm-hmm. image of this cube. Just shimmying along. <laughs> shimmying along. And everyone's like with like a little body in yeah. it, and it's just like floating along. <laughs> and and Adventure Time. Oh, yeah. Well, and let me tell you, it, and Adventure Time, it, they had a gelatinous cube in Adventure Time, and it did inspire the most cringeworthy thing I've ever heard out of Adventure Time. And it was Finn saying, don't flaunt it if you're not going to give it up. Ah. I was like, whoa. <laughs> Great like, with as progressive as this show is, and he said that, it's like, wow, how, wow. But yeah. I love gelatinous cubes. Um, and then I saw that they were doing that Funko pop of it, and I was like, I need that, and I'm never. Going I already to have it pre. Huh? I already have it pre-ordered. Oh, I don't think I'll ever be able to get it. Let me tell you, man, Funko pops. Uh, now that now that we can hit that tangent, Funko pops have replaced all of the collectibles of my in my life. <laughs> nice. Like I don't buy a collectible unless it's a Funko pop now, and like that's actually how I justify my giant Funko pop collection. Because, like, if I want a Funko Pop, I buy it. Like, I don't go, should I buy this Funko Pop? Do I have the room for it? Do I Like, I just buy the Funko Pop. Because, like, I look at it and I go, because I'm buying this one Funko Pop, there are five other collectibles I'm not buying because I'm saving money for Funko Pops. <laughs> like, I have a giant collection of Funko Pops, and trust me, it's not that I didn't spend a large amount of money getting this collection. I think we're, I'm getting ready to break 200 actually. I've saved money with that collection because I used to buy all kinds of little frivolous things just to put on a shelf. And now like I'm spending a fraction of that on Funko Pops. Nice. It's, it's, there's worse habits. You could yeah. be on heroin. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, you could be 100% on heroin, but you're not. Uh-huh. No, um, I'm not. Mm-mm. And, and, and it's like, I'll talk, I've talked shit about Funko Pops before and it's like wow like, I just can't see me having a huge collection of Funko Pops and here I am I've got three Funko Pops on my desk at work I've got two Funko Pops at least in the house somewhere and I'm like oh my god I have a small collection of Funko Pops I've never bought them. I have none you know what you know what I really like though Q figs I don't even know what that is Q figs are great uh do I, oh yeah that Batman right oh, there okay. that Batman's a Q fig huh mm-hmm they're really they're cute. cute. They're almost chibi, kind of. At my uh, on my desk at work, I have a uh, the best comic book couple couple that's never met: Deadpool and Harley Quinn. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, to say they've never met, I guess you'd have to say they've never met in canon. But there have been a lot of what if stories. Oh, there has like, been tons of fanfic. Let me tell you. Well, not even just fanfic, but like there's been official like what if stories, hasn't there? I'm pretty sure they've no, done not, like official. No. 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 Got it. No, uh, well, they wouldn't have DC characters in a What If comic, anyways. Well, they've done they've done crossovers though, right? Between DC and Marvel. I mean, yes, but I don't think neither Deadpool nor Harley Quinn was in the last big DC crossover. Gotcha. Yeah, they were into hero, superheroes, so I don't know. Oh, this is like out of my ballpark. Yeah. The last big crossover was DC versus Marvel, and then the. Uh, and then the ensuing amalgam comics where they mashed them both together. And I don't think either of them were in that. Also, kobolds are my favorite. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we came back. We came back. You love trash dragons, huh? Hey. It's a cold <laughs> oh, you missed it. Appar- it apparently, the uh, that little fear demon in the in the basement yeah. called uh, Anger a trash dragon, and the group ran with it. Oh, okay. They love the term trash dragons. Okay, yeah, I like trash dragons. <laughs> I, just, I like how they can be both super simple, level one. In fact, your bard has named the group the company of the trash dragon. Oh, okay. That's a thing. Oh, I remember you talking mm-hmm. about this. Yep. The the rangers. It, it, named our game in general the the chronicles of the trash dragon. Yep. Yeah. I don't know. I just I just like how they're both like a low level monster and a high level monster. Um, you. It just kind of goes off how the how the dungeon master is gonna play them and like how tricky he wants them to be because like in the book it talks about how they make traps and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. it's like your interpretation of how grand and damaging you want those traps to be. So if it's just like a two room dungeon and there's like a spear in the wall somewhere that pokes out, that's for like a good you know first level character campaign. But like you can get to the point where there's like 
50 rooms in this dungeon that leads to like a dragon's horde and like in every room there's like 30 plus damage traps that the rogue has to figure out if he doesn't figure it out then the damage is going to be drained of their resources until they go fight the dragon plus you can there's also uh intelligent kobolds that can even like have a good role play with the uh, interaction with the players see i would like to make the argument that all kobolds are intelligent mm-hmm yeah, I mean, I guess I mean more of like the. You mean like the civilized ones, almost. Yeah, like you, you know, you you've been fighting through these waves of just common kobolds, and eventually you get to like the armory or like the throne room or the hatchery, and then in the center, you know, standing this fairly large kobold with wings, and he's sitting there with his staff and his short sword, and you know, he, you guys can kind of like I don't know, conversate, you know, make a deal or something like that. He's obviously the leader, so like maybe you guys could figure a deal out. But I guess, yeah, you could also do that with the smaller kobolds. I mean, shit. I remember being in a game where uh, they literally just paid the kobolds to fuck off. They were like, hey, how about we just pay you money and you leave? And the kobolds were like, all right. I mean, yeah, that's a thing. Yeah. I think they're great for um, showing off the uh, ecosystem of a dungeon oh, as well. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. Like, a lot, a lot of, well, I shouldn't say a lot of. I mean, like, uh, some of the earlier dungeons and earlier dungeon masters... They just kind of like threw rooms in a dungeon and were like, this is in this room, this is in this room, and this is in this room. Mm. You can really show when you build a dungeon now that it's lived in. You can show that like how this dungeon, like how its ecosystem works. Like this is its food chain. This is like, this is how these things live off of one another. And like with all the different, yeah, with all the different types of kobolds and like different jobs that they have and things like that, especially if you've got them serving some sort of dragon. Like you can really show off the uh, their their ecosystem and how they live from day to day, and like not actually tell it, like not through exposition, but showing, you know what I mean, little clues here and there of how how they live their day to day life in that dungeon. Yeah, I also really like the idea of kobolds, like as because like obviously they're portrayed as always red or like a brownish color, depending on what book book you live in, and five either red. I always like the idea of it, like. The first generations red like their normal color, but then as they like worship the dragon that they're, you know, serving, they start to change their color through the time and then like eventually they'll all just be blue or something like that. So that yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's super cool. I also like to see kobolds as the halflings of the dragonborn. Oh yeah. 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 Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, I like the idea of I don't know if this is like official or anything like that, because I have read into their lore. But I was watching another Z Bradshaw video, and he was talking about how dragonborns are often not born to their kind. Like a lot of the times, like you can have like a dragonborn born to a family of humans or born to a family of elves. Oh, I had like a that. First, yeah first generation dragonborn or something like that. Um, I guess they'd have to have some sort of dragon ancestry in their line or something like that. But I really like that idea of yeah, like, like just like you know elf parents, you know, just like squeezing out a a dragonborn. Oh man! How do you explain elf, that? Daddy elf looks over at Mama elf like, "What did you do?" I, I, how would you? Do they breastfeed? No, no. I mean, they have, they have breasts. I think. I don't think they do. But then, would a dragonborn female lay eggs? Hold on. Or would she give live birth? This segment, this segment of the show is called Google Regret. <laughs> oh God! Do dragonborns have the boobies. <laughs> I mean, that depends on who you ask. Anything has boobies if you ask the right internet artist. That's true. Wow. They have big breasts. They have gigantic breasts. They Oh, wait. No, I got official art. They don't. No, wait. <laughs> this is official. Maybe it's just no. like, I mean, the verdict. They, they're, they're like larger plates, but... That could just be like... Those are gigantic, though. That, I mean, that's not official. Oh, I can't that be is official. Definitely not. That that's is, not official. That is a fetish. That is... Fan art. That should be hidden from children. <laughs> Rule 34, man. Good times. Female, dra- maybe I should type in female dragonborn and not dragonborn breasts. Yeah, that might. Right. Yeah, that might be better. Especially if, and if and really have to just tack official on the end of it. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing breast. Well, yeah, it looks like there's like a bulge, but I wouldn't. Like, know. they have like, they have like a, like a, a feminine silhouette, but they don't yeah. have breasts. Yeah, like they're live. That's about it. Mm-hmm. Like they were starting the Ooh, shape and then nice. like they're... So yeah, so we're going to go with no. Dragonborn women do not have breasts. Mm-mm. That, 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 
The guild council has spoken. Has the council spoken? So it's right. written. Okay. Or shall be. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, well, my only thing was, like, with that, you kind of have every every adventurer has, like, you know, their built-in tragic backstory. Like, you got to write in, like, with that kind of dragon board, it's, like, built in. Like, you know, you were born to, like, a family. You're a dragon born, but your parents weren't dragon born. You weren't accepted as a child. So they just kind of kicked you out and said, get out of here. So, right, right. Yeah, the. The the Dragonborn lore that I've seen is they were from another world and they were enslaved and they made their way to this new world, which I'm assuming is the Forgotten Realms, and they are um, trying to make their way in their own communities and stuff. And they don't really like dragons. They don't really like um, dragon gods. So, you know, a dragonborn follower of Bob Mutt or uh, Tiamat is kind of unheard of because they don't trust dragons because they were their slaves. Right. So th- that's the lore that I've always heard. Yeah, that but makes sense, too. The thing about D&D, there's so many different worlds. Yeah. I mean, hell, dragonborn have existed forever, yeah. but they were called draconians on Kryn. Mm-hmm. So... Obviously, everything's just left up for the interpretation of the dungeon master. The Yo, player. yeah. And in Forgotten Realms, you also have half dragons, and half dragons and dragon born are two entirely different. Entirely different. <laughs> and like, but they look the only if you looked at them like in fifth edition, the only difference is half dragons have tails, and dragon boards don't. Yeah. Dragon boards don't have tails? Not in five E, like officially. I mean, they could if you wanted them to. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess they could. Yeah, I mean, like, anything can have anything if you want it to. I mean... Also, at least... Oh, you're Pi-D, right. Elves have tails in my world now. Nice. Like, another thing about, like, <laughs> the difference is that half elf or half dragons, they seem to be, like, like they, they have way sharper facial features. Like the, well, and half dragons always, to me, seem more mutants than anything. You know what I mean? They don't look like natural humanoid dragons. They're always, like, these mutant, like... Or, like, uh... You can see like there's like like scales are just breaking out in some parts yeah. or like I well uh, referencing Critical Role again one of the guest stars I can't remember her name right off the top of my head uh, character or player um, great character though but it half of her face was just dragon um, who played that character really well known and I just can't even place her face right now Mike Wazowski. Oh my God! Get out. <laughs> Anyways, can't help it, man. I've never seen a single episode of Critical Role. I mean, either. I've like sat down to watch it before, and then so I guess I've seen parts of episodes, but like I always end up like looking at how long, like the time investment, yeah, like, like four each hour timestamp, and you're just like, ugh. And like I ended up like doing chores around the house, and then I've missed too many details where I'm like, what's going on? And then like I have to start the episode over, and then it's just like. So just haven't gotten into it. Yeah, it, it took it took me a bit. I tried getting in from. The, I guess we're talking about Critical Role now. I tried to get in from like season one, <laughs> and I had a rough way to go. And I'm, you know what? And and I'm going to respect the community, and I'm not going to say why I had a hard time getting into it. But I just couldn't get into it. And then I saw, you know what? Straight up, what drew me to it was seeing. Do you know who Jenny D is? Yeah. The cosplayer, I saw her do her Jester cosplay and saw her video of Jester doing the accent and stuff. I was like, this character is really cool looking. I'm going to go check it out. And I watched the first season or the first episode of season two. And I was immediately drawn in by every single one of the characters there. Right. I've actually heard the exact opposite from a couple of people. Like people mm-hmm. were thinking that the- one of them is invalid, but go ahead. <laughs> uh, like the, the second season characters felt like they didn't connect properly, or mm-hmm. you know, obviously those people both had uh, had both watched the first season and then moved to the second, so maybe they were like a bias, you know, right? Hashtag not my adventuring party kind of thing going on. Like they didn't like which. Those- you know what? I watched the well. I did try the first season though, so I can't even say that because I tried the first season. So I've had people tell me when I was like, I tried watching Critical Role and to get into it to start with season two. I've had tell people tell me that like, go watch season two and see if you like that better than you did season one. Yeah, I tried watching the first episode of season one. I got maybe twenty minutes in, and I was like, this is just too much. 
I have a I have a hard time watching other people play games. Like I like game grumps, but I don't like watching game grumps. I play it in the background while like I'm playing video games or I'm doing chores or I'm at work or something like that. It's just something nice to listen to. So I guess that's my issue with it is I like being able to interact with what I'm doing. If I can't interact with it, I'm not having fun. Right. Speaking of which, before this turns into a D and D podcast, let's, uh, <laughs> let's shift gears here. So, what would you say was uh, uh, your video game experience that turned you into someone who plays video games, a, a video gamer, if you will? What would be the experience that that made you just from you know, like everybody's played Mario at some point in time, or plays Mario Kart? You know what I mean? Your casual gamer. What makes what what brought you over to actually be like a gamer? Pokemon. Nice. Uh, I I got uh, my first copy of Pokemon from my brother, and it was Pokemon Emerald. And I play I put like 300 hours into it, and I actually found a uh, multiple shinies on that uh, on that game. If anyone knows what that is, and um, yeah, definitely Pokemon. And then Halo. Halo is the second clo- or a close second. Um, Halo is by far my favorite story and uh, PvP. But uh, that's just me though. Well, I guess mine, it, it's its not even a story about me playing games. <clears throat> we didn't really have a lot of money growing up. We were comfortable, but, you know, we didn't have money to spend on, you know, our Ataris or anything like that. So I got to go other places and watch people play. And really watching people play really got my interest peaked. But then my aunt took me to, uh, it was a laundromat. And they had a Donkey Kong arcade cabinet there. And she let me play. And that's really where it really kicked off is the arcade. Um, arcade games. I would play there. And then my mom would end up taking me to the, the arcade. Like the actual arcade. See, back in the day, they would have... <laughs> <laughs> I know what an arcade is. <laughs> uh, back, you see, like, now... I- I don't mean to. I don't mean to sound like you know the old man, like back in my day or anything like that. But like you, but you say you know what an arcade is. But like you know, during that era, like an arcade back then was not what an arcade is today, or even what an arcade was. Well, you know what? I'm gonna back ago. him up here. He's seen Stranger Things. He knows what an arcade. Is. <laughs> I don't watch TV or movies. That's thing. You guys are gonna find out about me. It's oh like, yeah, I don't get that reference. Yeah, he's just the... he's not our movie and TV guy. That's no. straight up. Yeah, I guess not because I went to a couple arcades and they were boring. I left like within twenty minutes of being there. I just kind of felt like I wasted my quarters. But uh, yeah, maybe they were fun. Mm-hmm. It, it, well, here here's the thing about that is with. I hope I don't get attacked for that. No, 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 no. <laughs> and you shouldn't. You shouldn't because mm-hmm. because you grew up in the time of the home console. You grew up in the time of the handheld video. And when I say handheld video games, we had handheld video games when we were young. But it was just a dot that just moved up and down the screen <laughs> and avoided things. Old. We are. <laughs> so yeah, you grew, up in, you grew up in the time of holding essentially a computer. Three times, to- like, well, like six times the power of a arcade game in your hand and playing it as you walk down the street. This is kind of a tangent, but I want everyone listening, and I probably want you guys to do it as well. I want you to go look at the new Xbox that's coming out and then do a little research and tell me that thing is not just a fucking computer. Yeah, I've been saying the same thing about video game console two or three came out. Like, they, they've been saying, oh, it's basically just a computer. It's basically just a computer. And, like, you know, it's getting closer and closer, like, like every time. But, yeah, the, the, that's what people have been saying about consoles for a long time. Yeah, even one of the first home consoles was called the Famicom. It's called the Family Computer. We knew it as the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System, but, like, it was released as the Famicom, the Family Computer. I was a Sega family. I hated it. <laughs> well, we had, we had Nintendo, but then, like, my senior year or senior year my when I, oh no it was i was in middle school and my dad i was i was a football player and my dad told me that if i started he would buy me any game system i wanted so i started my last game my eighth grade year and he got i asked for the sega genesis i got the sega genesis that was my 
uh, first con- well, my first like console I owned by myself was a uh, Game Boy SP. But like my first, our family's first uh, console was a Sega Genesis. I never got to play it though because I had like three older brothers in the house. So you know, my my time on little, it, uh, none. Little fun thing about Sega. A lot of people uh, think that Sega is some sort of acronym or some sort of Japanese thing because of the type of company it is. But Sega actually started as an American company. Um, and Sega stands for Service Games, S-E-G-A, Service Games. And they provided um, like pinball machines and things like that uh, to service members, like like the Army and things like that for like the USO in order oh, wow. to keep entertained on bases and things like that. Very cool. I never knew that. Hmm. All I knew is I got to play Shadowrun on the Sega Genesis, and it was the best thing ever. I would say my experience... Um, as a gamer that made me a gamer was actually with the Sega Genesis. Um, now I had a, I had an NES and like eventually had a Super Nintendo and all that kind of stuff. Um, everybody jump on the, the, the caster skilled train. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of is ironic because like my parents used to park me in front of a, a gaming system them as like a babysitter at times so they could go do adult things and then later they would want me to be a geek growing up so you know real catch 22 there but like sonic the hedgehog especially sonic the hedgehog 2 was like the first game that i like got lost in that and uh on the other side of things because i had a sega genesis and an nes around the same time uh kirby's dreamland for the nes were like my two games that like would like just like soak up my time when i was younger and then like i just kind of never looked back when it came to, to video gaming. Yeah, I'll, I, I will say that I wasn't necessarily done, 100% done with my story. Go ahead. Um, the, I will say, because you, you just kind of reminded me that there was something I wanted to add, and I completely forgot because of the, we went off on the arcade tangent, which is great because we needed to talk about arcade games. Yeah. Um, but I will say this is before I got to experience D&D, and before I got to really know how much I loved role-playing games, I was looking for, I, was, I think I was at a flea market. We were looking, at, looking for games and stuff. And I found this, this game. And I was sure no one had ever heard of it. The Chameleon. Well, he told my story, thanks. Are you, am I saying? No. <laughs> um, yes. Um, I was sure no one had ever heard of it. And no, none of my friends had it. They were always playing, like, you know, Tecmo Bowl and Excite Bike and stuff. And uh, got it home, I popped it in, it was like the best thing ever. And um, yeah, and at that time, no one, no one I was around knew about Final Fantasy. It's a little game, you may, you may have heard of it. Maybe. You may have heard of it, but yeah. Is that like a TV show? Uh, I mean, they made a movie, hmm. yeah. But yeah, it, it, it was great, it sucked me right in, and then I, I found a Nintendo Power strategy guide. <laughs> <laughs> Great. The Nintendo Power was a magazine. I know. I, the first and only, like, game book I ever owned was for Oblivion. Yeah. And it was, like, 300 pages of, like, lore and guides and stuff like that. But, yeah. Yeah, go on. I, I just thought I'd throw that little tidbit yes. in there. You were this there. was, like, a 15-page book. <laughs> Wasn't much to it, yeah. So yeah, so that was that was really my big one was um, getting into Final Fantasy. That really um, took me over the edge. Like I had that that initial love was there because of arcade, but Final Fantasy really, really taught me the joys of staying in my room for twelve hours at a time <laughs> and really pouring my love into a little box of electronics. Okay. The original Final Fantasy on the NES is actually a little bit of a interesting speed bump in my gaming career. Oh. A lot of my video games I had for the NES and the Sega Genesis were like secondhand. Like my mom just had friends who like played video games and they were done with video games. They'd give them to my mom and then I would play them. But the thing is like I'd get them like so secondhand that like it would just be the cartridge. Like I'd get no book, I'd get no context. It was just like pop this in and see what happens. And, like, when I popped in Final Fantasy and tried to play it, like, you know, the extent of my gaming at that point had been mostly, like, platformers. I mean, like, you know, back then that was that was platforms. You had Mario, you had, you know, Sonic, you had, you know, Kirby, like I said, you know, Contra, stuff like that. 
Uh, I mean, like the most adventure game I had played up until that point was like, you know, The Legend of Zelda, which, you know, that's that's a, a, a story of a love affair for a different time. But like, you know, when I popped in Final Fantasy, I was like, what is this? I was like, this is all menus and this is like, you know, I have to pick characters and like there's this story and like, you know, you can go here, but you can't go there and you can go here. But if you go here, you just get like completely demolished because you're not ready to be there. You know, going in the wrong area, just yeah. So like, it didn't definitely didn't turn me off to the game. I looked at that game as a challenge, and not even like the game itself being difficult, but like figuring out how to play it and what it was supposed to be was the challenge for me. Until like I eventually, you know, like got a hang of it, and like you know, by the time I got off, you know, the first, I guess, continent in that game would be the way best way to ex- explain it. You know what I mean? You beat Garland, like, you know, the first boss that, and like, you know, you can start, by the time I got off the first continent, I had it figured out. And like, I think I spent more time on that first continent than I did with the rest of the game because it took me that long to figure out how the game worked. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Like, uh, especially back then. Good Lord. Even, even, well, even having the, the, the book that came with it, it's still, it doesn't, Touch all faces. Yeah, no, you would have to go out and get and that then, Nintendo Power Book. And, and your parents wouldn't, or you didn't have the money, and there's no internet, so it's like, you know, you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> there was no internet. That's what I'm saying. Well, yeah, I mean, it wasn't even like whether your parents could afford it or not. No, I'm but... saying if they couldn't afford the book or anything. Oh, yeah. There was no internet. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. I thought, I thought you were saying if they couldn't afford the internet. I was like, no, no, I, I, I perfectly yeah, yeah. understand. There, how- there was an internet back then. Yeah, it was that, that consumer. <laughs> it was not consumer ready or consumer available, and it's not the internet we know today. But like you know, technically the internet did exist back then. This guy, sorry. Guy. Take your. Facts. I mean, am I, really, am I really being a geek or a nerd if I'm not hitting you with the um actually? Um actually, actually, he just nerd explained to us. I, mm-hmm. I can feel the sprays of dribble through the screen. <laughs> There it is again. So another thing about uh, okay. arcades. Final Fantasy breasts. Why am I doing this? <laughs> because you're a perv. Anyway, another thing about uh, arcades. Um, I realized that today arc- today's arcades, I went to an arcade, and I would say no less than half of the games there were just mobile games. Yeah. Put in an arcade cabinet. Hmm. Like it was games you could get on your iPhone or your you know Android phone. And they just put them in an arcade cabinet, and instead of microtransactions, they ask you to pump more quarters into it. Yeah. So, I don't know. Arcades are definitely not what they used to be. I mean, like arcades at this point, like I, I would say, arcades and video games in general have always had the stigma that, like, you know, oh, it's just for kids. Arcades in America at this point are just for kids. Yeah. You know what I mean? You got your Chuck E. Cheese, and like, you know, they try to they try to say Dave and Buster's is for adults. It's not. Yeah. Definitely I mean, not. like that was the no. that was the first quote unquote arcade I've been to, and it was so on fun because there was nothing but like little kids with sticky fingers touching all the controls and everything like that, and their parents were, you know, drinking somewhere off in the corner, and you know, it's just it just wasn't a good time. Well, there are there are barcades now. And, yes, uh, yeah, Kimmy went to one. I yeah, yeah, it's sixteen bit bar and arcade is the one I went to, and they have arcade cabinets all over the place and uh, uh, pinball machines and the best part about them they're all free oh yeah all free because you're drinking Mm -hmm. so yeah you go there you get a drink and i went there i met my favorite suicide girl there oh she was bartending at the time and i met a guy that looked exactly like alan tudyk i have a picture of him oh it's great nice it was funny. I was sitting across the bar. I was sitting, well, a few tables over because they have tables there. And I'm looking at them. And the people I'm with, I'm just like looking. I'm like, I think that's fucking Alan Tudyk over there. I'm like, no, that's not Alan Tudyk. Is that Alan Tudyk? I'm like, fuck it. I'm going up to him. I went up to him. And as soon as I got close to him, I knew it wasn't him. And I was like, hey, man, I just wanted to come over and tell you. He's like, I look just like Alan Tudyk. I'm like, yes. <laughs> so I was like, can I get a picture with you? He's like, yeah got a picture i looked at the picture this motherfucker i looked at i was like oh my god he's like yeah i taught myself how to smile just like alan tudyk because everybody always wanted my picture nice i was like that's the guy who 
is it. That's this that's guy. That's good you are welcome in my clubhouse. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish I would have gotten his name. And if I John- really, we need him on the podcast. Like we need, yeah. we need the clone yeah. of Alan Tudyk on the podcast. Well, it's funny too because I met I met the uh, Will Wheaton doppelganger too. Will Wheaton. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah, and and it was funny too because he already looked like him, but he was at our room party. So I was like, hey, man, can I get your picture? He was like, yeah, sure. I was like, do you mind if we stand in the shadows a bit? And he was like, he looked at me. He was like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Because he knew, he knew that just that little bit of darkness would be enough. And I, I put that picture up and people were going nuts. And then one person I know, God bless her heart, is just a fanatic. And she was like, Will Wheaton is actually in Australia right now. And it was just like, come on. <laughs> Why do you got to... Wheaton's actually me. <laughs> it was great. Mark on, by the way. It's not great anymore. I've never actually been into a bar. Oh, yeah. Never. Well, 16-bit would be a good, good... I've never been into a bar. I've never been into a gentleman's club. I've never been into any form of adult store. By a gentleman's club, you mean stripper joint? Gotcha. So uh, this this uh, this would be a nice little interesting segue. Have you ever met any of your uh, geek icons, and what was that experience like? Oh, I hang out with Brad every day. Hey. Uh, nice. I will I will tell you about the times that I've met geek icons and have been tongue tied. Like I got starstruck. Right. Um, so I'm a wrestling fan. And from Ohio, and I met Al Snow. Al Snow is uh, formerly a WWE wrestler, and um, I originally saw him at a Barnes and Noble, but he was over there looking at the maps. I'm like, I'm not going to go over there and bother this man while he's shopping or trying to find a map to get to where he's going. I'm not bothering him. So I let that go. Years later, he's at a con. He'd just done a movie, and he was signing movies i'm like you know what i'm going out and buying this dude's movie and i'm gonna have to sign it i'm gonna meet him Uh uh-huh so i got the movie he signed i shook his hand and as i was walking away i turned around i'm like hey uh i i kind of met you at a bar double and i didn't say anything sorry (laughs) (laughs) oh that's oh yeah and he was like you should have said something i was like i didn't want to bother you you were looking for maps yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I got to meet uh, Riddle from Riddle's uh, Messy Wardrobe mm-hmm. uh, cosplayer. Uh, I met her at Dragon Con. I just, I got a calendar and I just couldn't talk at all. Got my picture taken with her. Um, I'm crying in that, but don't pay attention to it. Right, yeah, no, yeah, don't. Don't pay attention to it at all. Uh, that wet spot is I peed myself. And then... Uh, I was I was at another con and I saw James Duvall walking down the hallway. I'm like at the corner, so there's a hallway here and it goes off to the right. And I see him walking towards me. I'm like, and I, I've seen okay, the movie Nowhere back in my younger times has a place in my heart as like a very awkward movie. And but me and my group of friends loved it and uh, we watched it all the time. So here he is. Oh, he was also in Independence Day. You might know him from that if you ever watched Independence Day. He was um, uh, Randy Quaid's older son in it. Okay. So anyways, he's walking down the way, and he he walks up. We make eye contact. I was like, hey. He's like, hey, how's it going? He walks walks down there, and I, I he almost he's almost out of range. I'm like, I loved you in nowhere. <laughs> he turns around. And he's like, oh, man, really? And he came back and started talking to me. He shook my hand. Oh, nice. Right? His name is James Duvall, right? Yeah. He said, you can call me Jimmy. Does that mean something? Uh, Yeah. It oh. means it's better than first name basis. That's like, you know, that's not nickname first, basis. Yeah, not yet. Yeah, not just first name basis. We have we have gone to familiar. One more step and I've been calling him daddy. Yeah. <laughs> or vice versa. Well, and then at nice. Oh, my voice and then, is cracked. And then a step after that, I'm exploding in his bed and turning into a cockroach please. scuttling scuttling away. Please call me daddy. Right, right. <laughs> I probably would have. I, 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 that's the sound. Maybe. And then, and then, and I wasn't tongue-tied with this because I was on the clock. I got to hang out with Voltaire, like, 
multiple times. I was I was his handler. I wasn't great at it. Mm-hmm. As in, I was the guy that got him from point A to point B. Anyways. Your chauffeur? Well, that would imply that I was just driving him, but I would escort him from, like, I would show him where he needed to go and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, again, I can't say I was great at it. But, sure. But, you know, I was also working against what the con was giving us, too. <laughs> he He's a fun guy. He's a fun guy. Full of energy. Um, no way I could keep up with that guy at all. At all. Word. <clears throat> you? Uh, the only, I don't know. I've never met anyone that was like an idol to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I can, I mean, the only idol I've ever had in my life is uh, Steve Irwin. And obviously I'm not going to meet him. But uh, so now I can't say, but like the only famous quote unquote person I've ever met is um, he's just kind of locally famous. The Night Owl guy, Fritz the Night Owl. Oh yeah. Oh my God. How did I ever hear about that? He's a hero of mine too. Yeah. He's, he's the only uh, like popular guy oh. I've met. Yeah, Chris and I. Okay, so anybody listening, you all have your local horror host. I know you do. Look them up. And when you do, I want you to watch their shit because it's awesome. You still have a horror host. I guarantee you. They may be still. They may be just doing stuff on the internet. They may only be doing stuff at your local movie theaters, but they are doing stuff. Look them up. Back in the eighties, early seventy or late seventies, even. Maybe even in the 60s. I'm not sure. We had Fritz the Night Owl. And he did not match up like with your regular horror host. You'll get a lot of horror hosts that are like ghoulish and like they have the ghoul face paint and they're made themselves up to look like monsters. No, 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 no. No, no, no. My Fritz the Night Owl. Goodbye. He had on like a nice silk shirt. He had bell bottoms, big glasses. big glasses that look like owl eyes. Paper hat. Uh, what? No. 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 Maybe. No. And he had a voice made for radio. Oh, definitely. Because he did do radio. Yeah, I was like, that's that's what I heard. He was like, yeah, he got big from was radio mm-hmm. hosting. Yep. But yeah, and he was our local Columbus horror host, and he did. And it wasn't just horror, you know. He would introduce. Uh, Godzilla and yeah. all that stuff. It was great, great. It's culture place. But here, here where I'm living now and where Parker's living, um, we have a movie theater, and he comes and does shows. What every couple months, maybe? I don't know if he does them anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I can't. I can't be for sure. I haven't been keeping up with it, but I think what happened is it got Fritz decided that he wasn't working with the theater anymore because mm-hmm. he wasn't getting enough business from it it just wasn't worth his time mm-hmm. there are other places he could do and you know he's he's obviously an elderly man now so he doesn't have the same energy that he did when he was younger uh, so he you know he can't just keep going 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 right going, going he has to pick and choose his battles now and um but uh, i think it i think he doesn't do it anymore but yeah when he was doing it he was there like once a month it was every it was pretty it, frequent, it was like, yeah. It was like the second Sunday of every month, or second Wednesday of every month. Or something oh, wow. Like that. It was a big deal. Uh, yeah. a, lot, a lot of people came in from our town to go see it. A lot of people from Columbus came into town, too. Yeah. Yeah, I think every time I went, it was a full theater. Oh, definitely. When I, I, I would either work tickets or concession. Mm-hmm. Which is a big deal for that theater. It does well. The theater does well, but if and now we're going to get... It's, I feel like... I, I feel like I want to get into movies and in the state of movies now, but I want to do this after Rick uh, talks about his stuff. But, but I mean, just a brief thing with the with the way movies are nowadays, a lot of people aren't going to movie theaters anymore because they don't have to. Yeah, Disney Plus now is going to be like a huge hit to movie theaters because Disney movies were such a large income. Mm-hmm. So now those aren't even going to be necessary anymore if you got Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. So, so, all right, Rick. So, um, I don't have a a ton. Um, I will say a while ago, uh, some friends of mine were doing a podcast and, uh, while it wasn't like, you know, critical role famous, like it did get a little, it did get a little famous. Um, and so I went to origins and hung out with them and doing their podcast thing for most of the time I was there. And, um, they got invited by Wizards to interview Chris Perkins. Oh, damn. Um, so I got to exchange pleasantries with Chris Perkins. Like, I don't have a story there. It was just like, hey, hi, I'm a big fan. Thank you. That kind of thing. 
<laughs> I love you. <laughs> um, but they also got to interview um, Danny Hartnell and um, Holly Conrad, who were cosplayers who were hired by Wizards for that convention to cosplay as goblins for the entire oh, time. Mate. And like, let me tell you, their goblin costumes were amazing. Like, they were really good. This is before uh, Holly Conrad got up in the pro Jared controversy. This is like back mm. when she was still married to like Ross from Game Grumps. And um, so they decided, um, they asked her after they were done interviewing for the podcast, because I had been bugging them the entire time at the convention. I was like, hey, once you're done doing your podcast stuff, we should try out this True Dungeon thing. It looks really cool. And so at the end of the podcast, they actually asked Holly and Danny. They were like, hey, we're getting ready to go do this True Dungeon thing. We've got a couple empty spots. Do you want to come do True Dungeon with us? And they did. So like, I got to do True Dungeon with uh, Holly Conrad and Danny Hartnell, which oh, was wow. super cool. Like that was that was super fun. And like I had an Instagram at that, that point. Um, and like for a good year, the only picture on my Instagram was a picture, a group picture we took with like me, my friends who did the podcast, and Holly and Danny. And I was like, because like that, I felt like that was cool enough to post online. Are you so, just never posted, and then that was the only one you posted? Yeah, exactly. Just because <laughs> like, I don't know, like I, it's in that time of my life, I felt like I didn't have anything going on that was cool enough to post online. So yeah, I was just like, this this is cool. You know what I mean? This is something that's worth someone's attention. So yeah, okay. It was I also it, was it? Did it at least get a lot of attention? It did, did not. Mm-mm. Put some hashtags nope. on there. No, because I had no idea what I was doing. That's okay. Um, I don't know what I'm doing either. Uh, and not a geek icon, but I also once re- met Richard Karn in an airport. Nice. If you don't know who Richard Karn is, nope. he was um, on Home Improvement ah. for a long time, uh, wow. acting opposite uh, Tim Allen as uh, oh. his character name was Al, I believe. Yeah. That's a yeah. blast from the past. I uh, I once told Lou Ferrigno there was no room on the elevator for him. Hmm. Yeah. And then I turned around and saw everybody had scooted back to give him room, and I was the dick standing there telling him to get the fuck off my elevator. I mean, but, like, still. I mean, the elevators have weight limits, and... I'm oh, no, no, no. You're not dying because you're a celebrity. Oh, no, no. I yelled <laughs> at this man to come back and get on the elevator. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I realized as I was yelling that he's deaf and that I should have yelled at the dude beside him tap him but he came back and he rode the elevator with us and it was all good huh. nice what a, what a story yeah i was a dick to luke brigno and i lived <laughs> i also uh i'm also a bit of a, a stand for my friends who do anything like creative like you know i would i would throw a lot of my own personal friends on that list if it wasn't like you know doing this for a podcast and everybody kind of like roll their eyes at it but like my friends who were doing their podcast, like I was the biggest fan for their podcast. So just like hanging out with them while I was doing that. One of the people who was on that podcast had wrote several plays and one of those plays became a movie. And like one of that, that movie is like one of my favorite movies. So like, I like, I made him sign his own Blu-ray, even though it was just like a dude I knew. And then like, you know, you know, any, anybody who does something creative, like I, I love that. Like I almost look at them as, as though in the same light as a celebrity, they just happen to be a celebrity I know. Yeah, I've, I've grown up in like an urban env- or a, a rural environment my entire life. Rural, 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 rural. Oh, 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 oh I messed that oh, one up. Oh, um, so I've never really met a lot of people, and like my, like I, I just got my license like a couple months ago, so I haven't really had the, uh, the transportation to go anywhere big. But now that I'm, you know, becoming more and more of a responsible adult. I want to go out and do things. So I'm, I'm excited to go to my first Comic-Con. I don't know when I'll be able to do it. Um, I'm just excited to start going to more gatherings of what's becoming my people, my subculture. Nice. So, yeah. You got a you gotta look, gotta look, lot of good ones in your area. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even just a little bit outside of our, I would consider it Indianapolis our area too. And that, I mean, you go out that far and there's even a lot of good ones that way too. Yeah. I'm pretty sure sooner or later people are getting like the, the just the way we talk about our surroundings. People are just going to cross reference if this gets big. People are just going to cross reference it and find out like exactly where we live. What? Yeah, nobody on the internet would ever do that. I don't know. I don't care if they know. I don't even care if they know what 
We, I don't care if people know what city and state I live in. Like, as long as they don't have my address, like it's. We, we, we haven't fine. even we haven't even posted this podcast yet, and we've already already been doxed. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's already hacked in and, and is listening. Right? Yeah. It, it was it was it was Parker's comment about not liking arcades. There's already like a bunch of mail stuff underneath my mail. It's all from Brad. <laughs> Oh, poor us. Okay, so you want to talk about uh, movies. So, yeah, basically the, the the state of the movie theater, I guess. I know I'm feeling kind of bad. I mean, they're doing okay still, but nowhere near as good as they used to be. I mean, it's horrible that the, drive, the drive-in movie theater is dying. There used to be so many drive-in movie theaters. Now there's like one near me at all. And then most people, they don't even go to the movie theaters anymore because they can just go and get it online. Yeah. And I'm not even talking about streaming services either. They can just get it. Get it online. Um, Really, the only reason to go to a movie theater is if you like the aesthetic of going to a movie theater. Which I do. But I mean, even as it's just a small, single screen movie theater, so it's hard to compete with those larger, like, like huge movie theaters that got like 12 screens and, um, Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, they got like, super good audio and they got like tons of snacks and stuff like that and plenty of employees and uh, it's just hard to compete. I would definitely say I'm personally a part of the problem. You know what I mean? Like I I hate going places by myself. The only time I ever go to the movies anymore is if it's a Marvel movie or Star Wars. Mm-hmm. I don't know if people should feel bad about it because this is, you know. It's a state of culture. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. we're a capitalist country, this, that, or the other. It's, like, it's your fault. The old ways are dying out. That and when that and when the theater was reopened, streaming services were already a thing. Right. So it wasn't like that was just somewhere out of the out of the out of nowhere that you know just popped up. Like that was already something. So I'm sure they already knew that that could have been a thing. But I, I think it'll be all right. They have multiple things set up so that if they get in trouble, that they should be fine. I flirt with the idea of going to movie theaters for like their special events and things like that. Mm-hmm. Like um, every once in a while, they do like a, a, a Miyazaki thing where they'll like show one by one, like each of the Miyazaki films in theaters. And I'm like, oh, that's super cool. And then like, I can't get anybody to agree to go with me. So I don't go. Yeah. Or like um, we have a really cool theater uh right here in my hometown and like it's been there forever they not only show movies there but they have like plays there and like i've lived here for what seven years now and like i've still never been once not one time have i gone to see a show there you know what i mean like i've, I've been like oh i want to go see that you know what i mean like they were showing raiders one time they were raiders of the lost ark um they've had you know live shows i've wanted to go see the guy even offered, like, once a year, I'd do a charity live stream where I'd stream video games for 24 hours, and I'd live stream the whole thing. And the guy even offered to host me one year and, like, didn't even ask for any payment. He was like, you just have to buy insurance for the space. And he was like, other than that, I'll comp everything. Even with him being nice and all that, I still haven't gotten off my butt and gone to see a single show and support him at all. Yeah. Huh? Sounds like something you should do. I think it'd be cool. Yeah, yeah we, we have a theater up around here in, in Columbus, Gateway that does stuff like that, that they show the Miyazaki uh, stuff. And oh, there was a, they do a lot of independent stuff too. They did a, uh, man, I can't remember the name, um, but they did like a horror movie uh, short award ceremony uh, kind of thing where they showed all the movies and showed what kind of awards they got and stuff. So that was cool. But yeah, they do a lot of that stuff. And actually uh, Fritz was doing stuff up there for the longest time too. I went to go see Labyrinth there. I've never nice. seen that. I heard it's really good. Yep. You should probably see that. It's, it, yep. You are in for a treat, sir. He says stuff like this to make me die inside. I legitimately <laughs> haven't. I'm sorry. No, no. No, it's fine. I mean, it's fine. You have that's a TV. Uh, I do. I do. We're going to watch it after this. That's a are trick we? a friend of mine taught me that, like, when somebody says they haven't seen something or played something, that, like, you know, you feel like they have to play or watch instead of, like, going, what? You haven't seen? And, like, you know, because it's very exclusionary. It almost makes them not want to, to oh, watch it. Or oh, no, I'm standing at the gate, sir. So, so yeah, like, wanging. my thing I'm now is I... at the gate, and as you walk up to the gate, I'm like, well, you've been here before, right? No? I'm offended. But come on in anyways. <laughs> oh, so, so friendly around here. <laughs> so I try to I, I, I try to use a phrase that my friend of mine taught me, and it's like, you are in for a treat. 
because they get to go experience that thing for the first time. Yes. I was forced to watch Pulp Fiction for the first time not too long ago, and it was okay. Uh, I actually went on a... uh, I don't remember the director's name, but the guy that made Pulp Fiction. Quentin Tarantino. Quentin Tarantino. Quentin Tarantino. I actually went on a binge, and we watched all of his movies. And I think Reservoir Dogs was my favorite. I think that was his first movie. Uh, his first big movie. No, no, definitely not his first movie. No, but um, yeah. So that's that's about as far as my uh, uh, highly acclaimed movie experience. I mean, goes. if you're gonna watch a Quentin Tarantino movie, yeah, make it Reservoir Dogs, I guess. But yeah, Django was good. I like Django a lot. I like Django. Yeah. Uh, least favorite was definitely Pulp Fiction, but it was still okay. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah, like I, I, I don't know because it was like the one that I was introduced with. It was the first one I watched, and it has such like a, a different way of film than most movies now. Mm. It's so like choppy and back and forth and like reverse, upside down, and all that shit. So it was like hard to to follow. But I mean, I had someone that's seen the movie like twelve times next to me. So I, if I had questions, you know, he was there to answer. But yeah, it was it was, it was okay. I mean, yeah, I. Yeah. I promise you I couldn't have done it better myself so <laughs> he's a millionaire off of his movies so my opinion's nearly not that that heavy but there's my opinion right right all right, all right. so yeah I mean I think that covers well I mean what what, what kind of movies because we didn't even we talked about our interests in gaming and stuff like what kind of mm-hmm. it, I mean it's safe to assume that at least two of us really like sci-fi and fantasy movies yeah yeah um well okay not quite. Um, Tell me all about it. So, I uh, like I said, I've only really gone to theaters for like Marvel and Star Wars, um, and that's like my whole thing. I have some very controversial opinions about movies I'm supposed to like as a as a geek or a nerd, right? Like, I am not a fan of the Lord of the Rings movies at all. Thank you. Well, that's I, you know, it's, uh, that's as a fan of the Lord of the Rings movies, I don't think that that should be something that should be a necessarily a geek milestone that's not something that yeah you know what i mean it being maybe you're like a, like that's not a must watch for geeks no. i it was one of like the like especially in my family like um my dad was all about lord of the rings and star wars and stuff like that but i i don't like star wars i don't like i uh, i will say that if you read if you read books and you're a geek, you, yes, you should read Lord of the Rings. I will say I'm a big fan of the book series. Like, I really enjoyed Lord of the Rings as a book series. And I'm not one of those guys who, like, doesn't like the movies because I think the books were better. Like, it's just, I think they're almost two entirely different stories in the way that they're presented. And I like this, the, the story that the book presents, and I don't like the story that the movie presents. It's fair. There's a lot of stuff that happens in the book that I think, that I think are pivotal or just really cool or really important to the story that don't happen in the movie. And I just don't have the time for the extended cuts. I, mean, I do. <laughs> Ever. Or isn't one of those movies, like, the extended cuts, isn't one of those movies, like, eight hours long? I don't know. I, I, I mean... I didn't watch the extended cuts. You mean cut. not extended cuts? No, the extended cuts. Is it, like, one of long the movies? Each. No, no, no. Is it, like, one of those movies, like, the extended cut, like, eight eight hours long, just, like, one movie? No? Okay. I heard something ridiculous like that. No, they're like three hours. That's still ridiculous. It's pretty long. It's too long to uh, watch a movie. Is it too, too, is it, is it too long to sit down on? Is that what you're saying? You make me want to talk. <laughs> <laughs> you make me sad. Sad. Aww. Sad Parker. Refer to me as sad daddy. <laughs> and then like... um. Other things that like I was supposed to like, Firefly, for example, took me eight tries wow. to get it. Um, I watched that first episode eight times just because people were like, "You need to watch Firefly. You need to watch Firefly." And that first episode just did not catch me. Now, like after the eighth time, when I actually watched the second episode, from then on, like I did really like Firefly. And then like you've got things like the Marvel, um, the Marvel Netflix shows, and like I, I don't like them. Wow, I don't like them. I love. I love the Marvel Did movies. You start with Iron Fist because you don't start with Iron <laughs> Fist. No, I started with Daredevil. Woo. I watched Daredevil for a while, and then like I felt like 
and this could just be my my ADD or like just the culture we live in where like you know my attention span is just shorter um like sitting down and like trying to binge that show like i felt like there were just like these long stretches of like nothing happening and like they just it just lost my attention okay and i was just it got to the point where like i would sit down and i'd go to watch something on tv and i was like oh i haven't i have more episodes of daredevil to watch and i was like i really don't i just don't want to you know what i mean there are other things i could watch it's the same thing that happened with game of thrones like I started watching Game of Thrones, and like I just got tired of watching people talk to each other. Yeah, no, well, Game of Thrones is another one of those shows that I don't think that should be held as a geek uh, standard. Right. Like it shouldn't. It shouldn't be like you need to watch this to be considered a geek because no, it, it's not. Well, like, it's not, a, not something that should be considered necessary. The Game of Thrones problem for me, I think, also stems from not only just people just standing around talking at each other, but like so many stories going on at once and bouncing back and forth between them. Oh man. Like, Fuck the books. Can we say that? Like I'm interested, I'm interested in Tyrion. And by the time we get back to Tyrion's story after going through like Bran and Khaleesi and like, you know, everybody else. And like, you know, by the time everybody gets together, it's too late. You know what I mean? They even lost my interest, you know? So Instead of saying it's not necessary for being a geek, can we say it's not canon? <laughs> I, I don't that know. Could get, that could get confusing. Yeah. Because like, we actually start to talk about stuff that isn't canon, but like totally is something you should watch. We could spell it different. I mean, they won't be able to tell, but like. <laughs> I will say I really like, like Marvel and DC. I love Marvel's live action movies and hate DC's live action movies. And then vice versa. Vi- reverse that. Like, I hate yep. Marvel's animated movies and I love DC's animated movies. Like, Under the Red Hood is probably like one of my favorite movies. Dean Winchester? Yes. I'm not sure they could have got a better Jason Todd. But yeah. Uh, uh, then the CW verse, the Arrow verse. Can't really call it the Arrow verse anymore because, you know, no more Arrow. The CW verse is great, DC. That's, that's another one that I started. I started strong. But to be fair, I started Arrow, like the Arrowverse started at a time when I was, a short period of time where I was unemployed, and okay. like I didn't have a whole lot to do, so like I was binging the Arrow. Okay. And like the moment I got a job, I was out of the Arrowverse. Like I stopped watching Arrow, I never watched The Flash, I never watched uh, well, you know, any of those other ones. I'll tell you what, I was not a fan of Arrow. I did like The Flash. I still like The Flash. But no, I wasn't a fan of Arrow. I swear to God, if they went back to that island one more fucking time, and then, <laughs> and then on that last fucking crossover they did, what they do, went right back to that fucking island again. <laughs> uh, I for real, you know, I felt like Brody in Mallrats, where he was bitching about that kid going up the escalator and down the escalator. Mm-hmm. That's exactly how I felt. I was like, that motherfucker is back on the island again. <laughs> it was killing me on the inside, and I even felt a kidney shutdown. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's heavy. It, it, it is heavy. So it's my blood. <laughs> that was Parker's. I can't take credit for that one. <coughs> All right. All right. We're getting kind of lengthy. So... <laughs> Let's uh let's let's cover one more thing. Okay. And we'll save some things for future episodes. All right. Um tabletop gaming outside of tabletop RPGs. So board we're talking games. Like board games, you know what I mean? I hate I hate saying board games because like, you know, if you're if you're not somebody who's in the know, everybody thinks you're talking about Milton Bradley and like that's Right, right, right. Well, I mean same no, thing. The, it's, the one board game that I would go to isn't even a board game. It's it's Red Dragon It. Yeah. Which is a uh, more of a card game, right? Yeah, and deck building, deck building card games. Oh, deck builders! Oh, fun. love deck building card games. What was that superhero one? It's a uh, the DC deck building. Mm-hmm. So I have okay. the uh, the only deck builder I own right now is Scott Pilgrim's Precious Little Card Game. Oh, I wanted to get that one. Oh, I'm I'm a fan. The other cool thing about it is, and like I think it's true of most deck building games, is you can play it single player. Oh, really? I don't think you can do that with DC. No? Uh, like, like, 
in the in the precious little card game, like you like pick one of the seven evil X's and you sit down and pick your character, and then you just deck build to try to beat the evil X before they, you know, beat you. Okay. So yeah, that would work. That'd be fun. Um, I've been playing a lot of Betrayal Legacy as of recent. Oh yeah, yeah. I've I've actually been getting into that too. I got a friend group we meet once or twice a week and every time we meet we play like we play two games we play like two rounds of betrayal legacy i won't say too much about betrayal legacy because like if you haven't played it or if you are currently playing it it's really cool but there could also be spoilers because like there's a story i'm gonna try to talk about it yeah there's a story to the game and like now the other cool thing about it is, is like I could sit here and talk about my story, like the story that we're going through, and your story could be a completely different story. That's true. Because That's depending true. on what you do in the game, like you know, you you do different things, but like still, you're you got your tent poles, and those are the same, no matter like you know who who's playing or to what game you're playing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and I'd probably say the original Betrayal is probably my favorite box game. Okay. Probably my favorite, you know, board game. Um. Like, that's the one we always end up going back to. It's like if I have friends over and we're like, hey, what are we going to play? Like, you know, it's e- it, it's it's so easy to explain to somebody how to play that game. Because, like, for the first half of the game, you know, before the haunt happens, it's just like, look at your character's speed. That's how many rooms you can move. Just explore this house. That's all you got to do. And, like, you know, as things come up, you kind of explain the rules for those things. And by the time the haunt happens, which is the second half of the game, they've got the basic rules down. So... It's, it's yeah. really well put together game. Yeah, I, I like it. It's probably not my favorite, but if we're going to if we're going off of having friends over, ease ease of learning, um, fun factor. I'm going to go with flux. Oh, yeah, flux is a good one. You can pull it's that fun. out. That's yeah. super simple. Yep, flux is flux is simple. Sim- and there's it's there's cheap, a flavor of flux for everybody. Play. And there's there's a flavor of flux for everybody. Like if you're having your friend over who's like into a certain thing, you can be like, hey, here's Star Trek flux. Let's let's play. You know, here's you know Cartoon Network flux. You know what I mean? My so favorite just... is the Batman the Animated Series flux. I don't have that one. Good. I don't have that. One. I've got I think I've got standard Cartoon Network Cthulhu. That might be it. That might be all. Uh, I have. And, and if you insist on playing Munchkin, get the Marvel Munchkin. Is it good? It is really good. Whenever whenever I had friends over who wanted to learn how to play Munchkin, I would usually use the good, the bad, and the Munchkin okay. to teach them how to play Munchkin. And then we would play another type of Munchkin if they wanted a different theme. But like, I don't know why. I don't know what it was about good, the bad, and the Munchkin, but it always seemed like the easiest one to teach. Yeah, I'm, I never. I don't think I've gotten to play that one. It's pretty pretty obvious what it is. You're right. Are there any... Uh, Board games that you'd wish you'd get to play more often, but you don't necessarily have a, a group of friends to... Red Dragon Inn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right back to it. Oh, yeah, so fun. The, well, see, the thing about Red Dragon Inn is you have to have a good group of people. Yeah, everybody you have, be into it. I think you should have at least four people, no more than eight. If you go more than eight, it's going to be a shitty game. You could do three people, but it's not great. Four people, perfect. Eight people, still pretty good. Yeah. nine people it's like what the fuck is happening i don't know what it is it's that one person over that just screws right. the whole game over um but yeah and and if you get into the characters that you're playing and don't worry about the mechanics because they're all balanced out they're all balanced you just you just play that game and let it run and it's just beautiful such also clank clank is a great game that I wish I got to play more often. I think, I think mine... Probably more. But. I think mine would probably be... Um, well, first of all, i got a bunch of games that I've only ever gotten to play the chance to play once or like are still sitting in the box because I've never had the chance to play them mm-hmm. because they just seem like they're... Anytime we try to pull them out, they seem super complicated. And then, like, you know, if you're having friends over for a game night, like, learning... Spending half an hour learning a game is not usually something people want to do. Right. Um, so, like, those are some games I think I'd want to get into. But um, Sentinels of the Multiverse, I really enjoy. But I don't have friends over enough to play it. And a couple of my friends that I do have who come over for game night pretty regularly aren't into the whole cooperative thing. They're very competitive. Like, they want there to be a winner at the end of the game. Mm-hmm. So, like, Sentinels isn't really up their 
Allie. And then I helped kickstart a game a long time ago uh, called Dice Throne. Um, well, I haven't heard of that one. And uh, it got it got decently popular. You can find it in like you know the bookstores now. Like you can find it in Books a Million and Barnes and Noble and stuff like that. And it goes actually in seasons now. Like I, I have Dice Throne Season One, and you can go get Dice Throne Season Two and Season Three. And it's basically the same game, but it's different characters. And uh, like it, it involves like both dice and cards. Like on your turn, you roll dice, and you're trying to make Yahtzee like rolls. Okay. You know what I mean, like, um, so like if you get like three of a kind or a full house or you know different things like that for your character, your character get different moves. So like you know the season one, you've got like the monk, the paladin, the ranger, the thief, the sorcerer, um, and the fighter, and like they all have different moves they can do based on what you roll. And then like you're also drawing cards, and like you have like a kind of like a point buying system for the cards, almost like a deck building thing. And the cards can modify your abilities or modify your roles. Um, and you can play one V one or two V two, or, you know what I mean? Have everybody for themselves. And like, you know, you're just kind of trying to be the last person standing. Um, and it's, it's super fun. I recommend checking it out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you said it's new, right? I mean, it's not new anymore. I mean, like now, like I said, I think they're in like season three or season four. Um, I was like, I heard Kickstarter, so I was like, oh, that's probably why I've never heard of it. Yeah, no, like, yeah, it got kind of popular. I mean, like, but, you know, I mean, like, you can't expect everybody to keep up with every game that comes out. I mean, like, that's, that'd be ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, I tried for a little <laughs> while. I tried. Um, and my buddy Mike is actually way better at keeping up on all the new games, but, I mean, even even he can't keep up with all of them, so... Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a rough and, and and it sucks too because there's so many good games. I love Kickstarter for what it's doing in mm-hmm. uh, putting get, putting great games in the hands of people that would have never gotten it before because big gaming companies would have never made them. Right. So, so yeah, definitely Kickstarter's doing doing good work. Oh, Betrayal started actually. Now that I'm really? thinking about it, I'm pretty sure I helped kickstart Betrayal. Like. Betrayal as in, like, the, the first, not Betrayal, Betrayal Legacy? Yeah, like, Betrayal at the House on the Hill. Like, I'm pretty yeah. sure that was a Kickstarter game. Wow. Because I, I thought that was an Avalon Hill game. Avalon Hill bought it after, like, okay, so you have Betrayal at the House on the Hill 2nd Edition. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that they have 1st or 2nd Edition. And Avalon Hill put out the 2nd Edition. I have the 1st Edition got of it. the game. Which I which I got as a Kickstarter backer. Now, the more that I think about it, I'm like, yes, yes, I did do that because I remember seeing the Kickstarter, getting excited about it, and I remember like forgetting I had ordered it, and then it coming in the mail, and then you know trying it out, and the components being really bad. Um, like the 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 copy, the first edition that I have, like the character cards, mm-hmm. you know, the little clip that you put on the character cards to show your stats. Mm-hmm. The clips don't stay on the cards. Ooh. So like um, you know what? Now that you mentioned, it, I think I remember playing that. Or they they never stayed on there. Yeah. So like we they, they're there there are a bunch of free apps you can download that do the same thing. So like I literally anytime somebody comes over to play, I'm like download this app. It's free. You're going to need it to play the game. But like not not to knock the makers of the original copy at all. I mean like they made an amazing game and like something that like was unheard of. I think at the time. I mean like the fact that you could play that game over and over and over again and have a different experience every time is, is still amazing to this day, but especially for that time in gaming. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, it got good enough that Avalon Hill picked them up, you know? So, yeah, I mean, it was a great concept and um, I think it was probably a bigger deal than, I mean, I bet the people that sat around and thought of that idea were like, this is a great game. Everybody that plays it loves it. They had no clue how big it was actually going to be. Sure. Yeah. All right. So, anything that you uh, think that we didn't cover that you want to say as a as a wrap up? Or... I mean, in in this, without, uh, I mean, I guess as a wrap up, I mean, I, I like where the world of geek is going. I, I like I like all the like you get all these people that bitch about like all these old school. Gamers, all these old school geeks bitching about how everything's becoming so mainstream now. And, oh, we used to get beat up for this stuff. And it's like, 
okay, but why don't you shut up for a second and realize that people aren't getting beat up for this shit anymore. Right. And they're making way more stuff now, which is putting it in our hands. We're getting <laughs> so much more stuff now than we used to. D like, you know, we can bitch about all the different editions of D&D, &D, but look at all the dice that we can get, all the <laughs> miniatures that they're making, all the books that they're putting out now. How easy it is to find a group. How easy it is to find a group. Uh, yeah, and, you know, it's still hard. But, you know, back then... In the, back in then, the society that we're in, uh -huh. in the society we're in, like, like, these big companies, like Wizards of the Coast could turn around and, like, shut down half of these small companies that, like, are do making, like publications for their game like oh this is an unofficial D, D supplement or this is unofficial D, D minis or this is an unofficial thing to help you with your D, &D. like which is the coast could turn around and like shut like more than half of them down and they don't you know what i mean they just let you know especially in the society the capitalist society we live in like they, they that could be a move that they could do or they could turn around and buy these people up in order to try to make more money but like the you know the the geek culture just they just allow that to thrive and exist, and that's, I think, awesome. I think part of that could also be people would probably just go to Pathfinders if Wizards oh. just starts being a douche. Pathfinder. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Pathfinder. Like this, that's the thing. Pathfinder is the best example of Wizards shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah. But then I also think, like, if Wizards really wanted to, like, that's one of the things they could have turned around and shut down. No, they if couldn't. They really wanted to. No? No, they couldn't. Okay. And we'll I'll tell you story. why. Because they put it in their own uh, fine print. Wizards put it in their own fine print in the open source game, in the open license gaming of third edition. Mm -hmm. They made it so that uh, Paizo could use that D20 system as long as they came up with their own uh, fantasy world. Mm -hmm. There's nothing they could do about it. So not only did Paizo take this take this system that was started by Wizards of the Coast, make their own game from it, but then they also proved through two more editions that third edition could have just kept going. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's, you think about how, like, the, just the difference in supplies and resources that the Wizards must have compared to the Pathfinders, Ooh. and I mean... Most people I talk to prefer Pathfinders because it, there's just so much more material and so much more official and unofficial stuff. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, too, is, you know, people say that they're different editions. That's fine. Third edition, 3.5. Uh, Pathfinder, sure, they're different editions. But guess what? You can still take your silly ass down to the other editions and use shit from that and yeah. take it into Pathfinder. Everything that came out for 3.5 and 3.0 even if it takes just a wee bit of adjustment, yeah, you can use it in Pathfinder. Right. So there's so much, so much. And all the splat books that came out in 3.0 and 3.5. Oh my God. So many splat books. The the all about talking about the additions and the addition wars and that whole thing, that could be a whole episode onto itself. That really could be. That really could be. So yeah, well that's that's where it is. I'm just happy that the geek world is moving the way it is and it's it's more mainstream it's up and up bitch about bitch about uh the big bang theory all you want bitch about stranger things all you want it's stuff like that that's putting good games in our hands i i mean i i, I was one of the people that went through high school and middle school as like a you know an upcoming geek and i never had once an issue not once that anyone ever called me out on it teased me about it mm -hmm. if anything it was, it was like it was shocking how many like footballers and you know like people you would think would be just straight jocks right but hear you talking about like war to warcraft and then they'd stop and be like oh you play war to warcraft what's your username nice and uh like i had a you know i used to play pokemon at, like at lunch in middle school monster hunters and pokemon and stuff like that on my psp and I remember there was like plenty of people that would just watch me play and didn't have anything bad to say about it. So, well, that's great. Yeah, that's awesome. The only other thing I'd want to say is I hope um, I hope this episode has give, given people an idea of who we are and, uh, <laughs> and like, what. Uh, and despite all that, we hope you come back and keep watching. That'd be neat. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll not be here, but I'll be thinking about you. He'll be here in spirit and the cardboard cutout that I had made of him. But um, we uh, we don't 
um, claim to be experts on anything. We don't claim to know more than anybody else about anything, especially when it comes to these topics. You know, this is just stuff that we like and we're some of it, you know, that we're passionate about. We just want to talk about it. And like, hopefully, um, you know, you listen to us talk about it, possibly joining into the conversation when we have an email set up or something like that is something that you'd want to do. Um, you know, other episodes won't be exactly like this one. We're going to have a little bit more structure and like, you know, topics and stuff like that. But, you know, hopefully. I think that, I think that was a big thing. Like when we first, when we started talking about the topic tonight, I really didn't want it to be straight edge. Yeah. yeah. We have a schedule that we need to cap. I wanted this to just be boom, just yeah. free form. We just go at it. Talk about yourself. Again, like you said, people are getting to know who we are and this is really introducing them <laughs> to how we yeah. are. How we talk. So, yeah. All right. So, how we um, treat our guests. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you if you know us personally and you're listening to us and, like, there's something you want to talk about, like, let me know. And, like, we might structure a whole episode around it and make you a guest. So, yeah. And, and it, I mean, and eventually we're going to – I'm sure we'll put out our social medias and stuff like that. And you know what? Right now we're not going to put them out. But if you find us on social media, make sure you tell us where you found us. Yes. So, because I'm on a bunch of social media, so good luck finding me. So, like, you know, I'm I'm on, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, OnlyFans. I'm on uh, uh, TikTok. Wait, wait. What? What? No. I, I need I need I need I need a link to a couple of those. I need I need because I uh, I didn't oh. I didn't know you had an OnlyFans. Oh, you know. did I say that out loud? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> OnlyFans. Uh, it's for fandom stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, when you're a fan of, of a person in particular, especially. I'll download it and uh, <laughs> I'll download it and send it to Frying Pan. Is no! It, is it no! Like, never touched OnlyFans. Like, I know the jokes and everything. Like that, is, is there even an app or is it just a website? I think it's just a website. Yeah. I, I really don't know what it is. I assume I know what it is, but I actually don't factually it's know a, what it is. I'm sure it's a wonderful, wonderful site. I I'm, very, uh, I'm very I'm very sex worker positive by the way so yeah that's it it is it's it probably works out very well but I've never done work on it so I don't know how they treat their workers so watch out for the uh, Casters Guild calendar the first place you can get is our on the Casters Guild OnlyFans page oh right right I call me <laughs> oh I'm March that's my birthday call it now March <laughs> oh, oh, oh there's three of us like we're all gonna get four months okay Master <laughs> Blank. <Blaine. laughs> oh, <no. laughs> <laughs> well, what we'll we'll just uh, we'll, me and you will pick our months, and then we'll just uh -huh. hand them out to the guests as they come in. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Oh, but the ones that aren't filled are character not unlocked, and then once we get <laughs> a guest, we'll reprint it and fill that spot. It, 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 it fills in like as as we get. Right. 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 As, you have to scratch it off with a quarter. <laughs> Sent it too. Oh it my smells, gosh! Or oh, like or even better, we'll we'll just get like an advent calendar, but it's like for the months instead yeah. of like the days in a month. And all of them just say, "I don't know." We'll see. <laughs> so thanks for listening. If you liked what you heard, share it with a friend. All right. And uh, hopefully come back for more episodes. Thanks for stopping by. Bye. Come back and see us sometime. And scene. <laughs> <laughs>